But what makes our profession so rewarding? Getting to know our patients and their families and really taking pride in the personal care that we provide is getting harder in the current climate. The future of general practice is at stake and we must defend it. I've been thinking a lot over the last year about general practice and the way in which our service supports the rest of the NHS. One way to think of this is of general practice being like a giant dam, holding back the waters, preventing the flooding of secondary and tertiary care downstream. But there has been a lot of rain and the level is rising. During 2014-15, general practice teams across the UK will provide as many as 428 million consultations, up from 362 million five years ago. We are providing 1.3 million consultations every single working day. Meanwhile, the wall of the dam is being chipped away brick by brick. When we take GPs away from in-hours practice work and redirect them to providing extended access or supporting other services, or even working for CCGs or health boards or CQC, we are taking more bricks away from the dam. <laughs> Last year, I publicly announced that despite the fact that general practice deals with 90% of patient contacts in the NHS, we received just 8.39% of the budget. Well, it is without a shred of joy that today I can announce that since last year, our slice of the NHS cake has become even smaller. The percentage of the NHS budget spent on general practice in the United Kingdom is now just 8.3%. And most worryingly, in the face of relentless workload pressures, we are not attracting enough new doctors and nurses into general practice or doing enough to retain the highly skilled workforce we have. All of these developments have resulted in further weakening of the dam. Colleagues, the wall of the dam, the service of general practice, is under huge pressure and unless urgent action is taken to repair and restore it, then the dam could burst with terrible consequences for our patients in general practice and indeed for the whole of the NHS. When I was elected to this job less than a year ago, I knew that something had to change. That is why, on November the 16th, the day on which I became your chair, I launched our Put Patients First, Back General Practice campaign in partnership with the National Association for Patient Participation. The first challenge we faced was to convince the rest of the world that there is a problem. As some of you may have noticed, I have not minced my words about this. I've said general practice is in crisis. I've said we are on the precipice, at the point of collapse, that we are facing a ticking time bomb. And famously, I said in The Guardian that general practice as we know it is on the verge of extinction. Now, those of you who know me would agree, I think, I'm usually an optimist, always wearing my rose-tinted specs. So these weren't phrases that came naturally to me. As a profession, we could have kept our heads down and stayed quiet in the hope that things would get better. But when I hear about GPs who are seeing up to 60 patients a day, practices that are on the brink of closure and patients waiting weeks for an appointment with their overworked family doctor, I know we made the right decision to speak out. Six years ago, the BBC reporter Robert Peston was accused of sparking a run on Northern Rock shares by speaking the truth about the global financial crisis. But it quickly became apparent that he was right to issue the warning he did. So although I, like Robert Peston, have been criticised for spreading doom and gloom, 
I believe passionately that the College is right to speak out on behalf of our profession and on behalf of patients. General practice is in crisis and that crisis is not going to go away unless we do something about it now. I spoke out because something has to change. The wall of the dam is crumbling before our eyes. So far, much of the damage to the dam wall has been hidden from the public. They've seen the flooding downstream in A&E and in hospital pressures, but they haven't been aware of the pressure on the dam itself. GPs, nurses and practice teams have been absorbing that pressure by trying to do more and more with less and less. But if we let that situation continue, we will see whole chunks of the dam fall apart when practices have to shut their doors. When a practice closes, not only do patients lose out, it piles more pressure on neighbouring surgeries, swelling patient lists already bursting at the seams. Every practice closed is a loss to the local community. With a growing ageing population, not to mention a baby boom, we need to increase capacity in general practice, not take it away. Other businesses would be expanding to meet demand, not shutting down services and closing branches. We all know about the 98 practices in England, identified by NHS England as being at risk of closure due to the removal of MPEG, the Minimum Practice Income Guarantee. Today, I can reveal that new estimates from the College are that 543 practices in England alone are at risk of closure in the next few years if something isn't done soon, and that this number could be as high as 600 across the United Kingdom. These are practices in which a very high proportion of the GPs are over the age of 60 leaving the future uncertain given that we know the average retirement age of GPs is 59. This shocking state of affairs indicates the extent of the workforce crisis our profession is facing. We know we have a problem with the number of people entering general practice, but the pressure has become so great we're increasingly finding that talented, dedicated GPs are retiring early, going abroad or taking up other careers. It was estimated in March that applications to undertake GP training had dropped by 15% in England, with only 40% of medical graduates choosing to enter general practice training. This is a disaster waiting to happen for our NHS, and I promise that the College will not stop campaigning until the four governments of the UK take action to turn this crisis around. We must... We must recruit, return and retain. So in the face of these problems, is there any appetite to rebuild the dam or is it destined to be broken up completely? Since we launched the campaign, we've had an overwhelming response from GPs, practice managers, practice nurses and patient groups right across the country. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank our fantastic campaign partners, the National Association for Patient Participation, for all their support. Thank you very much. Most importantly, the public have backed us in huge numbers. 300,000 people signed our petition over just a few short months this summer three times the number to trigger a debate via the Downing Street website. 300,000 people called on our nation's leaders to fix the dam and save general practice. The passion and commitment of those who have supported us has been truly inspirational. And now, for the first time in generations, politicians, as we heard this morning, are putting general practice at the heart of their plans for the NHS.
Politicians have been talking about the pressures facing GPs in the Scottish Parliament, the Welsh Assembly, the Northern Ireland Assembly and Westminster. Already the governments of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland have announced new investment in general practice this year. £4 million in Scotland, £3.5 million in Wales and £3 million in Northern Ireland. Our devolved chairs, John Gillies, Paul Myers and John O'Kelly, have done a brilliant job of making the case for change in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland and we are so lucky to have them. In England, CCGs are starting to think about how they can invest in general practice and I think it was good to hear the commitment of the Health Minister in England to the work that CCGs are doing. And earlier this year we secured an assurance from the government that the £3.8 billion Better Care Fund can be used to fund GP services. And over the past week, both the Labour and Conservative Party conferences have been dominated by announcements that will involve investing more in general practice. First, we had the Labour Party leader, Ed Miliband, pledging that if elected, he would deliver 8,000 new GPs as well as more practice nurses and district nurses in England by 2020. This is something we've been calling for in our 2015 general election manifesto. Then, as we've heard earlier this week, the Prime Minister announced that £400 million will be invested over the next five years, if they are elected, in supporting practices to form federations as a means of providing flexible opening hours to patients across their local area. And this morning we heard the Secretary of State for Health in England, Jeremy Hunt, announce that he is very concerned about three areas, money, capacity and GP burnout. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome the independent study that he has commissioned from Health Education in England. And we, will, we do commit to working with them in this analysis. I think it will be highly informative to get accurate and indeed localised views on the workforce, the GP, the clinical workforce and the support workforce we need in general practice to meet the needs of our patients. I also welcome his acknowledgement that general practice and mental health have not had adequate investment and that investment into our services needs to happen. So as the battle lines are drawn for the, for, for the coming general election, I think it's hugely positive that the political parties are now competing with each other to talk about their vision for patient care and general practice. It shows how far we've come and that the campaign has shaped the debate and set the agenda. Of course, we do need to make sure that general practice does not become a political football. The announcement made by the Prime Minister earlier this week about flexible opening hours is a case in point. We thought there was much to welcome in the detail of his proposals, not least the extra £400 million of investment and support for federated working. But the media debate around the announcement gave the false impression that all patients will be able to walk into their local surgery in the evenings and weekends. Headlines like that serve to raise expectations that general practice cannot live up to with the resources that we are currently given. While we should all take heart from the fact that the major political parties are putting general practice at the heart of their manifestos, neither of the two major parties have got it completely right yet. We should be encouraging politicians to be ambitious, but I am determined to make sure they understand the realities of modern general practice and that they give us the resource and workforce to deliver. So how can we build on the momentum we've gathered so far? The first thing we need to do is shore up the dam. We need to solve our workforce crisis by making sure politicians deliver on their promises to recruit and retain many more GPs. With respect to GP returners, we need to make it easier for good GPs to return from overseas, to return from maternity leave and to stay in our profession. 
It is time for our health departments to publish a clear timetable on how we address this problem. And at the other end of the scale, it is now time to seriously look at financial incentives to encourage medical graduates to train and then practice in areas that currently don't have enough GPs. We've called for what would effectively be a Teach First scheme for general practice, combating health inequalities by ensuring that we strengthen general practice in the areas where patients need us most. But these measures on their own won't be enough. We need a bold new deal for general practice. One that unleashes the potential within general practice to transform the way the NHS works from the bottom up. If the NHS is to survive, it needs to move away from the narrow focus on specific diseases and conditions that worked in 1948, but don't meet the needs of patients here and now in the 21st century. As any GP or practice nurse knows, multimorbidity is now increasingly the norm for our patients and the future NHS will need our skills as expert medical generalists more than ever. That's why last week we came out strongly against the plan set out by the Labour Shadow Health Secretary Andy Burnham to restructure the NHS around hospital-led integrated care organisations. As far as we are concerned, that would destroy general practice as we know it and do irreparable harm to patient care. We need an alternative vision. Earlier this year, we set up the inquiry into patient-centred care in the 21st century. This groundbreaking piece of work is being led by Mike Farrer and we're grateful for the knowledge and vision that he's been bringing to this task. The inquiry will be reporting its findings soon, but I can tell you some of the key aspects we expect it to address. Firstly, it will look at how we recognise and address the huge challenges posed by rising levels of multimorbidity and get policymakers to understand the need for adequate time to care and continuity of care to improve outcomes for these patients. Secondly, it will consider how we can build an NHS that effectively tackles not just physical health problems, but also associated mental and social health problems. And finally, it will highlight the need to seize opportunities to empower patients as partners in their own care and promote greater self-care. Alongside this, there will be challenges to the profession too about how we can better organise services and make them transparent and responsive to the needs of patients in a meaningful way. We know that GPs up and down the country already want to achieve many of these things and indeed many are already doing so despite the pressure we are under. The inquiry will provide an ambitious blueprint for how we can break down financial, practical and cultural barriers to building an NHS that is truly patient-centred. But we won't be able to turn this blueprint into something that makes a tangible difference for patients unless we are given the time, funding and workforce to do it. And that's why we need a new deal for general practice. Just like the dam, general practice in our four nations is a monumental feat of engineering, keeping our communities safe and healthy. The dam that we have built together has served our patients so well for 60 years. In the last few years, general practice has had to withstand huge shocks and strains. But the dam is still holding. That's because of what you do. You fight for patients day in and day out. You make sure that patients are able to rely on the kindness and skill of their local family doctor. You find time to make sure that no patient is left without care, even when it feels like there aren't enough hours in the day. Thank you for showing the resilience 
dedication and sheer strength of character to keep going on behalf of our patients. You're all fantastic. In the last year, the College has shown what can be achieved when we stand together with our patients and speak with one voice. Let's continue to make our voices heard and demand a new deal for general practice, a new deal for each and every one of our patients. Thank you very much.